Welcome to this episode of Disease Du Jour on the topic of tips on foot lameness with Ty Wallace, DVM, MS, DACVS, a partner at Equine Athlete Veterinary Services. Equine Athlete has doctors based in California, Kentucky, Arizona, Michigan, and a hospital located in Pilot Point, Texas. Dr. Wallace is based in Pilot Point, where he focuses on lameness, sports medicine, pre-purchase exams, and orthopedic surgery of equine athletes in training centers throughout the country. I'm your host, Kim Brown, publisher of Equimanagement. The Disease Du Jour podcast is brought to you in 2021 by Merck Animal Health. Welcome, Dr. Wallace. Thank you very much for having me. I'm glad to be here. Well, we really appreciate you coming and uh, talking to us a little bit and sharing your experiences on this really important topic. Um, So let's kind of jump in and and talk about what are the most common foot lameness emergencies that you see in the field? Um, I think that would probably boil down to uh, horses stepped on a sharp object, possibly a nail, et cetera, um, or a heel bolt laceration would be probably the two most common emergent type situations that a veterinarian is going to run across in the field. And can you give us a little bit of maybe your um, hoof lameness diagnosis in the field when you're working on some of these trauma or emergency cases? Yeah, I think the probably the most important part is um, actually the phone call with the client when you're on your way there, uh, just trying to get your head around exactly you know what you're getting into so you make sure you have what you need. Um, and making sure that client is educated on what you would like them to do or not do. Um, I think the, the big thing there would be, you know, the, the classic case of the horse was out in the arena, you're riding and all of a sudden it comes up lame, you notice, you know, seems like there's something in the foot, you pick up the foot and you've got a nail in there. Um, and I think that, you know, most people's tendency is to get that out of there as quickly as possible. That's what you would do if you had a nail in your foot. Um, but it's pretty important to the veterinarian to know exactly where that nail went. So if, if you're in a situation where you can leave it in and keep the horse calm and manage it, potentially hold that leg off the ground where they're not driving any further until you can take a radiograph and, or an x-ray and see exactly where that nail goes, um, that can be super beneficial in, in knowing have we, you know, penetrated potentially any uh, synovial structure, the back of the coffin joint, or did it go into the navicular bursa, uh, flexor tendon at the insertion on the bottom of the coffin bone, etc. You know, if the nail comes out or if somebody pulls it out, that's not the end of the world. You can certainly inject uh, renographin or some other radiopaque material in there that's sterile and take a radiograph and try to figure out exactly where it's gone, and that might be part of your workup anyway. But um, it's always best in my mind if that client knows to leave that in there and it doesn't run and, and pluck it out so you can make sure. And you also mentioned heel bulb lacerations. Walk us through what your process is when you have a horse that's injured that way. Sure. It's, it's just one of the more common lacerations that you treat. You know, horses are commonly getting their foot caught underneath a piece of pin or in a fence, and, and that's a part that sticks out off the back of the leg and is a easier for them to get entrapped, and then when they panic, they pull back, and, and that's where the laceration occurs. And they're really not that big of a deal to get healed up if they're managed correctly, but uh, the workup part of it is the most important. A significant percentage of those do communicate with the synovial structure, either the coffin joint, pasture joint, uh, you know, digital flexor tendon sheet, or potentially navicular bursa, but by far and away the most common is actually those palmar pouches or the coffin point. So, you know, it's part of the workup. You usually block that area, get it cleaned up really well, put on some sterile gloves and sort of digitally explore the area with your finger and see if you can figure out, you know, what might have been penetrated or, or damaged. Um, and then based on that exam, what you think the most likely you know, synovial structure could have been penetrated is. I'll typically do a arthrocentesis of that area, stick a, a needle into the front of the coffin joint, for example, where you can do a sterile prep and you're away from the dirty area of laceration. Distend it with some fluid and hopefully build up pressure. 
and then the fluid runs right back out the needle, um, that would be the best scenario. Then you, you know, have it penetrated that joint. But if you're not able to build pressure in that fluid that you're putting in the front of the coffin joint comes out the, the laceration, well, then you know that you've penetrated that snowball structure. I'm using the coffin joint as an example, but that obviously could be any of those other, you know, synovial structures that I mentioned before. And the difference in the threat to the animal, um, both from a soundness perspective and just surviving the injury, is, um, you know, an order of magnitude difference if it's got synovial involvement. So it's really important to figure that out early on. And these are not injuries that, you know, the horse owner wants to try to manage with a bandage and some topical antibiotics or even oral antibiotics for a period of time. It's, it's, it's tough to tell if you've got that involvement with the joint. And if you do, the course of treatment is, is vastly different. So it's, it's really important to figure that out. Right. And a little bit about um, on the diagnosing. Do you use, when you're working in the field, what equipment are you using mostly? Radiograph, ultrasound, what's what's your go-to? Um, when it comes to the foot, it's it's especially with emergencies, it's almost exclusively x-ray. I mean, there might be a, a, a time or two when you might need to ultrasound something in the pasture to, to figure something out, but um, x-rays is always part of the workup um, and then deciding if you either tap the joint or not. Um, because you want to make sure, you know, do we have bony involvement? Has there been a, a fracture sustained in association with that injury or not? And then it also gives you other information because, uh, you know, if gas has entered a synovial space, sometimes we'll see the gas bubbles on the other side of the joint, and that'll be another clue that, that you better, you know, dig deeper and tap that joint. So is there anything else, Dr. Wallace, on traumas or emergencies that you'd like to share with our audience? Um, I think the, the big thing there is the decision to refer or not. If you don't have synovial involvement, then most of these can be treated in the field. If you, you know, got an experienced practitioner that knows how to manage that situation. Um, if you've got synovial involvement and Financially, it's an option. Those are always cases to refer because those need to be, you know, flushed, um, potentially scoped, but usually at least needle flushed and lavaged out. And then we tend to infuse the affected structure with antibiotics locally and do regional limb perfusions where you put a, a tourniquet on the limb above the laceration to kind of trap the blood in that area and then place an IV catheter distal to that and infuse it with antibiotics and let it sit there for 20 minutes or so. You get really high levels of antibiotics and a, a lot of bacterial killing power doing it that way. So we tend to get pretty aggressive with these on the front end um, from an infection standpoint. The management of the laceration itself, they're almost always all the same. You usually you know, close what you can with suture and then support those with what we call a slipper cast or a phalangeal cast that basically goes from the foot or from the bottom of the fetlock and incorporates the foot. And for me, in my experience, that's the biggest thing uh, to reduce cost and speed up the time to recovery in these cases is supporting them with the cast rather than trying to do bandage changes. It's just a, a dirty area for a horse and it's very difficult to keep it clean, plus there's actually a lot of motion in that area. So um, if you can decrease that by supporting it with a cast, they just you can get these healed up in about three weeks versus six to eight if you're trying to do it with a oh, oh, goodness, that's a big difference. Yeah. Uh, well, let's, let's move on maybe to some of the orthopedic-related um, injuries, maybe from training or other things. Um, how about coffin joints? Um, front end foot lameness is probably the most common spot for, for lameness in the horse. And, um, you know, a lot of those do either originate with the coffin joint specifically or they're in close enough proximity to the coffin joint that that is a good vehicle for treatment. So, you know, there could be other things that are not specifically in the joint causing lameness, but they're close enough to the joint that if you can put some anti-inflammatories into that joint, it's going to be a good spot to hold the anti-inflammatories slowly leach out into the tissues that are affected. Um, coffin joint arthritis obviously is a 
a very common spot that's a, a high motion joint even though it's completely enclosed within the hook capsule there's a tremendous amount of flexion and extension with that joint as a horse travels and you're taking a lot of weight and concentrating it down into a very small surface area so um, if you do get a cartilage injury in that region then it's it's likely that that's going to develop into degenerative joint disease or osteoarthritis depending on the terminology and um, of course, in that area, we always are worried about navicular injuries or just navicular disease. What are you seeing and what are you doing with those cases? Today's Disease Du Jour podcast is brought to you by Merck Animal Health, the maker of prestige vaccines, Banamine, Panicure, Regimate, Protozil, and other trusted equine health solutions. Merck Animal Health works for you and for horses. Learn more about Merck Animal Health's comprehensive portfolio of products, as well as their ongoing investment in our industry, profession, and community through programs such as the Respiratory Biosurveillance Program at MerckAnimalHealthUSA.com. Well, with the advent of MRI in the practice, you know, it's really changed our viewpoint of, of what's going on in those horses that block to a PD block, the, you know, for the caudal third of the foot of the sole. A lot of those, you know, you block them out, take some radiographs, find some changes on that navicular bone and pin the horse with navicular disease and, and treat it the best you could, either through a cough and joint injection or occasionally through navicular burst injection or something like that. I think with, more and more of those cases over the years going to the MRI where we can get a lot more information about soft tissue disease within the hip capsule. Um, we've kind of learned that really very little of that lameness probably originates with the navicular bone itself. That might be a, a bone that's changing and showing us some symptoms on our x-ray, but the vast majority of them that have those changes on x-ray, we find a lot more going on with the soft tissues around that, either the collateral ligament of the navicular bone or the bursa itself or a deeply reflective tendon in that region, whether that's an adhesion or, you know, an actual tear. There's just always a lot more going on in there than, than what we suspected prior to it. So again, you, you kind of make an emphasis on diagnosis when you get that initial feeling that that's, that's the area, the, the, the navicular area. Yeah, I mean, I try to be realistic about it. Um, that That is an expensive diagnostic modality, so I don't automatically put every foot lameness through the magnet. But, you know, I think if you have a horse that walks to the foot, you radiograph it, you don't see a lot going on, and it's a fairly, you know, mild lameness. It's performance limiting, but the horse is able to be a horse. Then I think, you know, trying a more of a broad-based therapy like a coffin joint injection, et cetera, and seeing how that horse responds once it gets back into some exercise can really be the deciding factor uh, between what the next step is. And, you know, a lot of those horses do just have a, a synovitis or inflammation of the coffin joint itself. And you quiet that down and they go on and, and get comfortable again and able to do their job. But a significant proportion of them also will be good for two to three weeks and then the lameness returns. And that's when I make a pretty big push for further diagnostics like we almost always radiograph that foot first go round, and then if it comes back we'll typically ultrasound it and see if we can get an idea of something going on with the collateral ligament of the coffin joint or a deep flexor tendon through the pastern region um, in certain cases you can ultrasound through the frog and see some things going on in the in thesis of the ddft or the you know impar ligament or what the bursa looks like but Right. Usually, for most of us that aren't Dr. Denois, um, <laughs> you need a little bit more information from an MRI to be able to sort that out, especially with the collateral ligaments. You know, I always scan those and try to predict if that's affected or not, but the vast majority of those that have an injury are at the distal enthesis where, it, where that ligament inserts on P3, and you just can't scan that far down, so you really need a MRI to figure those out. Yeah, and that makes a lot of sense. And in the long run, probably saves the client money from just either the horse being out of performance or trying other things 
you know, before you get a good diagnosis. Absolutely. So let's let's move on to the pastern. Okay. The pastern with lameness is uh, the bane of many veterinarians' existence. I think there's just there's a lot going on there. Um, it's not as simple as just the pastern joint itself. Um, those are actually a fairly easy diagnosis for the most part, but it's just a tricky area to get to an answer. I think the anatomy on the palmar aspect of the leg through the pastern region is pretty complex. Um, it's difficult to ultrasound with a, a high degree of confidence that you're actually seeing the problem or not. Um, that's another thing that we've sort of learned through MRI is that we used to you know, make a lot of diagnosis in the pastern with either radiographs or ultrasound, and then you end up finding these portions that are sent in for a foot MRI because we had to and learn all sorts of new things about the anatomy and problems with the pastern region. Um, and then also there's the diagnostic analgesia part of it. You know, we, you're taught in school that you do a low PD and you're basically getting a total third of a foot in the sole, and that turns out that's just rarely true out in practice. And I think those can get within the epidural sheath and, and go higher up the limb than you expected. And you can end up blocking pathology even as high as the fatlock joint with a PD on a pretty regular basis. So I think that whole area is, is difficult to image and difficult to nail down a diagnosis on. Okay. And then you... Um had mentioned when we were chatting before we started the podcast about the soft tissues in the pastern also being an issue. Yeah, and, and that's sort of what I was talking about, you know, just now all the flexor groups and the distal sesmoidian ligaments and about 14 other ligaments with really long names on the palmar aspect of that pastern that may or may not communicate with the digital flexor tendon sheath and may or may not respond to therapy or blocking of that structure can just be really difficult to diagnose if you're not scanning pastures on a daily or multiple times per day basis. Yeah. Okay. And is there anything else on maybe the immediate care, the diagnosis of these injuries, whether it's traumatic or orthopedic related, that you would like to share? Any tips or tricks? Um, not really. I mean, I, I think that the probably one of the more important things that you sure don't want to skip is just a good basic exam of, of how that horse is moving, how the foot hits the ground when you're on a, a level, firm surface like, you know, broom concrete or something. Um, in your hoof tester exam, I think we get pretty dialed in to, to trying to find that, you know, joint problem or, or soft tissue supporting structure, collateral ligament, whatever it is. And a lot of these horses are or just sore from the foot, you know, digital cushion, um, something going on with the bar of the foot or the angle of the sole, um, a shoeing issue where you're taking some sole pressure somewhere, whether that's out at the toe or, or under a bar, you know, things like that that can be pretty easily overlooked if you are diving right in trying to find that, you know, really cool core lesion in the deep digital flexor tendon and, and really all the horse has is a, is a form. You know, those. it's easy to miss those sorts of things, and um, I think that's an important part of the exam is how that horse's foot's landing, what the balance looks like. You know, in school, you're taught a bunch of angles. Palmer angle needs to be between 3 and 5 degrees positive from horizontal. You know, where should the breakover point be exactly with respect to the tip of P3 or the coronary band on the lateral X-ray, things like that that are good rules of thumb, but they just don't always work um, with every horse's particular anatomy. You know, with a, maybe the horse has long sloping pasterns and, and that palmar angle has to be more flat or they're, you know, really putting a lot of strain on their suspensory apparatus, et cetera. So it's important to just watch these horses move and see how the foot lands and see if anything looks that normal. Well, talking about pain from the foot and, and shoeing, what is your approach to management of some of these um, lame, hoof lamenesses with a shoer? I mean, with a farrier and with shoeing? Well, it's a. Um, I learned something new from the blacksmiths and farriers that I work with 
every single case. Um, and I really appreciate and uh, enjoy that relationship that I have with those guys. Um, you know, there's been a lot written in the past about the angst that can be created between the veterinarian and the farrier. And, um, I guess I just haven't really seen that in my practice. Maybe I'm just lucky or, or maybe people are more educated these days and that's not as much of an issue as it was in the past. But um, I, I just think there's so many different ways to treat foot lamenesses and there's a lot of different, like, broad ideologies. You know, you've got the folks that have learned from Obnachek and, and go that direction, or Redden's group, or O'Grady, or whoever, you know, sort of these big, large camps of blacksmiths and farriers that are really experts in their field, and there's more than one way to do every single thing. And right. So I try to figure out what that farrier likes to do, what he's talented at, has experience with, and then try to come up with a game plan together with that person, um, you know, that fits into their wheelhouse so that it's successful for everybody. If you try to change up too much or, or go a different direction with what that, you know, farrier is not comfortable with, then it's just going to be frustrating for everybody and, and probably not a good outcome for the horse. So um, I really don't like to pigeonhole it too much into any one technique, but, um, you know, I think using the, uh, for me and the types of horses that I typically work on, you can really achieve a lot by manipulating two different things. One would be the, the sort of contact surface of the shoe with the ground and how you manipulate the surface area of that. Um, I enjoy going and learning from the high self group and, and have tried to incorporate a lot of Dr. Denois' shoes and theories into our practice and um, have seen some really good results with Horses that, you know, bad pasture joint OA, for example, that uh, just are not responsive to corticosteroid therapy and nothing works, and you're contemplating the, the pasture and arthrodesis, and, you know, the client's not wanting to commit to the either the financial strain of that or the time out of work to accomplish that. Sometimes just switching that shoe around and putting more surface area on the opposite side of the foot from where the main cartilage loss is can make a huge difference. I've, you know, I was at a horse show last weekend and took a horse from a, a head bobbing grade three lane to completely sound in the ring just by putting on a shoe with a lighter branch under the healthy side of the pasture. So, um, you know, I think those techniques when you're treating, you know, soft tissues are painful when they're being stretched. So we try to put the wide part of the shoe under the side that's affected so those don't sink into the ground as much and aren't stretched and become more comfortable. And things that are going on in the bone or the joint are more painful under compression. So it's just the opposite. You put the wide part of the shoe under the healthy side and, and that transfers the weight up that side and lets the compressed side sink into the dirt, kind of cut into the dirt like a knife blade because it's like surface area and provide those horses with some relief. You can do the same thing, you know, front to back as well. Um, lowering the heels by putting more surface area out at the toe that's going to load up your deep digital flexor tendon and provide relief if that horse has pain in his suspensory apparatus or his superficial flexor tendon and right. hopefully if you're trying to you know help a horse with a ddft putting a lot of surface area at the back and an open toe shoe um has opposite effect and it's a dynamic though right when they're standing around in their stall everything's level feels normal but working through the dirt that shoe can have a big impact on it. then the other thing i guess is is the you know addition of a pad and impacting material whether that's a, a poor impacting material or a impression putty that you mix together just to if you've got a sore bar for example you know that's a really good trick is to have a blacksmith use some putty and put that horse in a frog support pad and just to nail it on and let the horse stand there until everything sets up and pop it back off and you can cut the putty out of that whole side of the foot, transfer that weight to the frog in the opposite bar and, and give that side some relief and, and get your problem fixed. So it, yeah. it's pretty interesting to change some of the mechanics of that stuff and, and not even touch a syringe. Like that. <laughs> and, um, 
What do you have any other um, comments then on either working with farriers uh, or trying to work on manipulating weight bearing on some of these horses and, and their problems? Um, not really. I, I just I can't emphasize enough the importance of watching that foot hit the ground. I usually try to do that with the blacksmith and get their impression of what's going on. And then, you know, just always try to make that a very group-centered decision on how we're going to move that surface area around and make sure that, number one, we're all on the same page. And number two, sometimes those guys find other things going on in the foot that make that specifically not an option for this horse. And, you know, oftentimes that's not our area of expertise and we miss those little nuances. So, um, you can't always expect somebody to fill a chewing prescription if you've missed, you know, one of those little key factors. So I really like a group consultation or at least a phone call if I can to make sure yeah. that everything's going to work out for that person's best interest. Okay. And is there anything else on this, Dr. Wallace, that you would like to talk about with hoof lameness? No, I don't. I don't think so specifically. Um, you know, obviously, regenerative medicine is the new frontier and kind of a buzzword, and, and no different with foot lameness. And we, you know, that's in my mind part of the discussion about a expense of an MRI and whether we're going to go that route or not. Right? You're almost always going to get a diagnosis, so that's important. You usually get some prognostic information, which is often important to the client or the trainer because these are usually big financial investments. Um, but it also might change the course of therapy. You know, you might have had one idea and then you get that MRI and you're like, oh, that's right where that lateral inserts, I can get a needle right there and put a small amount of PRP or whatever it is um, you know, that, that you're using at that point in time that you like and really kind of change the outcome for that course. Well, that's good. Okay. Well, we certainly appreciate you taking the time today, Dr. Wallace, for joining us on this episode of Disease Du Jour. And to our audience, thank you for listening. And a special thanks to our 2021 sponsor, Merck Animal Health. We invite our listeners to uh, rate episodes of Disease Du Jour on iTunes, SoundCloud, Stitcher, or wherever you listen to your podcast. And if you have any questions or suggestions, you can send me an email to kbrown at equinenetwork.com. Disease Du Jour is a production of the Equine Podcast Network, an entity of the Equine Network, LLC.